it's a little overwhelming to see him in the flesh for the first time. Tall and heavily built, he still has the physique of the boxing champion he once was. In any public gathering, he's head and shoulders above the crowd, and if that isn't enough to make him stand out, his reputation certainly is. The man who expelled 40,000 Asians from Uganda. The man who said Hitler was right when he murdered six million Jews. The man who is said to have liquidated up to a quarter of a million of his own people. The author of outrageous telegrams to political leaders throughout the world. His Excellency, the Field Marshal Dr. Idi Amin Dada, VC, DSO, MC. Possessor of all mighty power and knowledge, the Lord of the clans and the land, the father of all twins, the cook with all the firewood, the Lord of the shield and spears, the Queen Termite the President of the Second Republic of Uganda. With respect, sir, I ask this question, do you think you're a tough man? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am very tough, yes. And I will never give up. If I wanted to do something, I will ne never change my mind. Is that a good or a bad thing in a political leader, toughness? Toughness is good because uh, the people respect you and uh, tough men is a... Uh, quality which you can find for the uh, high command because when he gives order they know that that order is uh, is given by the strong man and they must be obeyed it is very important <laughs> country which has supposedly thrown off the yoke of British colonialism, Uganda still retains a strong legacy from the days when it was an outpost of Queen and Empire. The band plays on while the arrival of His Excellency is awaiting. Idi Amin loves public ceremonies, especially when he's the centre of attention. And in Uganda, that's all the time. An Amin's speech is almost a self-parody. Sometimes he genuinely means to be humorous, and he can count on getting a good laugh from his admiring, not to say overawed audience. But at other times, the humor is unintentional. Here at a clothing factory, part owned by Japanese interests, the field marshal was obviously trying to be nice to his international guests. I am always speaking the truth and the frank, and I have been in Japan during the Second World War myself. And I know Japanese members of the armed forces and the Japanese themselves are one of the best fighters in all type of war. If you want a suicide pilot, you will get from Japan. If you want a real jungle warfare or guerrilla warfare, Japanese are the best. Because I think... But now, since 1972, from 73, we, we put up a trousers plant, which was not there before. And now, fighting in Ukure. So, this clothing factory is one of the biggest industries in Kampala. Amin has made it clear that he welcomes overseas investment within certain guidelines, and the Japanese investors in this company have good reason to thank him. Since the departure of the Asians, with their stranglehold over distribution throughout Uganda, the company's profits have soared. Amin chalks it up as a significant victory in what he calls the economic war which he began with the expulsion of the Asians. In Kampala, tall modern buildings and a boom in the construction industry are signs that the Ugandan economy is far from collapse. But the buildings are financed by international aid, much of it from Arab countries, and the external appearance of the city hides some serious economic problems in day-to-day -day life. 
Despite some press reports to the contrary, this is not a city or a country that's falling apart at the seams economically. In the streets of Kampala, the cars are modern and kept in reasonably good condition. And the shops, too, once the economic stronghold of the Asians, seem to be reasonably well stocked and well run. Of course, that's not to deny that there are serious shortages here from time to time. Salt and sugar can be enormously hard to get, and we've found it very hard to get a beer in our hotel from time to time. There's no poverty here. You won't see any beggars in the streets. And despite the fact that I may get impatient that only one out of the three lifts in our hotel has worked during the week we've been here, that perhaps is only a white man's impatience, not shared by native Ugandans. Some consumer items are enormously expensive, and the price of everyday essentials like flour and bread is very high. Before Amin expelled them, almost every business along this road was owned by Asians descendants of the indentured labour brought in by the British. In 1972, Amin gave the Asians 90 days to get out of Uganda. Their businesses were confiscated and handed over to native Ugandans. Now the signs over the shops have African names. It was a move that made Amin popular with his people, but it left the country perilously short of skilled professionals to run everyday services. And uh, therefore you should inform your country that we here in Uganda are now in position to work with the whole world community. We can employ them, we can give them responsible position in our Uganda. Even if we find that in that particular area we need somebody in ministerial level, we can put him. Whether it's Russians or Americans or British or African, I want just to, or Indian, I will put there. This I just wanted to inform you, because what we are interested is to see that it is the money management of that particular department. This is very important for us. I thought that I should tell you. And with that, we can even run our administration very smoothly. <laughs> No doubt that whatever the rest of the world thinks about him, Idi Amin is popular with black Africans. His strident nationalism and the flamboyant, if somewhat crude way, he criticizes his old colonial masters, has earned him admirers outside Uganda, who see in him a black leader who refuses to play the game by the white man's rules. And if that means that Uganda has to go without some of the benefits of the white man's society, that's all right too. Africans point to the richness of their own culture as something worth preserving and which is imperiled by the imposition of Western-style governments and economic systems. If this is the man who's responsible for the death of nearly a quarter of a million of his people in a bloody reign of terror, it was impossible to see that reflected in the faces of the people who came out to see him. Ours was a carefully guided tour, and we were under constant observation by our means government officials. If there was any truth in the dark rumours about the early days of his regime, it seemed particularly unwise to pursue them. A political leader who wears a pistol during a television interview is a force to be reckoned with. You're a very popular leader with your own people. Yeah. What do you think explains that? Uh, because I am not cut off completely from my people and uh, I make myself as simple to the people to be approached. I can talk to them and I can solve their problem and I can allow a group of the people to talk to me, put their complaint rather than being stopped by anywhere. I, can, I go to them and they know that uh, whatever they want to be solved, I can solve for them. And that uh, uh, make them have a confidence in me. Do you maintain still a non-aligned status in world powers? Do you have a favorite as, say, Russia versus America? Uh, I, uh, that is their own internal problems between Russia and uh, America. I does not, 
I don't want to interfere there because uh, what I want from Russia should not be stopped by Russian, by, by American, and also I can buy anything. As I was saying here that uh, I have my Air Force, I have American, I have Russian, I have uh, also Chinese in the government. They used to train my army, and now we have Chinese Ugandan instructors. And uh, I, I am non-aligned. I am, in, I am also free. Uganda is a free country. It can work with any country which it wants to work with. It seems that you've been very shrewd then in the world of international politics. You've used, you, you've, you've kept this position to Uganda's advantage. It is true. And we are in a better position today in Uganda. See, when I started it was very difficult, but now uh, we are in a better position than any country today in Africa. To outsiders it seems that there are still big differences between members of the OAU. Do you see those differences being healed as time goes on? Every country, sovereign state has got the right to say and to take a decision on which he thinks is good. And I think uh, Africa is uh, united even than ever before. And I'm very happy to see that uh, you should say what you think it is right. You shouldn't uh, be stopped to say. And this is what Africa is today. And I'm very happy about it. It is not divided. Africa is united. And uh, you find uh, some leaders, uh, because I did not recognize the MPLA, they said I should resign from the chairmanship. But they are my best friend, you see. And after explaining to them my position, they are very friendly. It seems a pity, sir, though, that when a country becomes independent, like Angola, that there is no unity of brothers, as it were, uh, that a group of people who want independence can't agree on a, on a principle and a philosophy. It is uh, true, and that is because might be some uh, independent, uh, some of the liberation movement, they have been getting assistance from different country with a different uh, political ideology. That is the reason of this. But we are trying our best as uh, chairman, myself, OAU, to bring them together. You, you were quoted as saying once that Hitler was right when he murdered six million Jews. That was a, a story that was put out. Anyway. Might be Hitler was against Zionists. <laughs> but you're not opposed to Jews personally. I am not against Jews completely. I am a friend of Jews, but I am against the Zionist policy of expansioning the Arab lands and also kicking away the Palestinians. They must do everything possible to return the Palestinians back to Palestine and form a government of the national unity between the Arabs and the Jews together. This was my main uh, aim. Excellency, it seems that without doubt you must be the best known of the African leaders. And I think one of the things that has made that possible, quite apart from your chairmanship of the OAU, has been telegrams you've sent to leaders throughout the world. With respect, sir, sometimes it seems you're almost a mischief maker with some of these telegrams. Is that, is that part of your makeup? But uh, my telegram it is based on the truth, because I don't want any leader or any country making mistake in the world. Therefore, it is my intention to correct that leader of that country. Do you think they've been that is the reason why sending that uh, telegram? <laughs> you mean President Nixon telegram? <laughs> Idi Amin is first and foremost a soldier. He runs his country the same way he runs his army. The orders come from the top and absolute obedience is expected from the lower ranks. It's very hard to get details about the size and strength of the Ugandan military establishment. In recent years, the Russians are believed to have supplied 60 helicopters, but President Amin seems to get military supplies from everywhere. He told Four Corners that he bought rifles from Australia, and we noticed an American crew in one of the Air Force planes we travelled in. It's all part of the rich pattern of contradiction by a man who revels in the play of power politics. If he can play the big powers off against each other, so much the better for Uganda, he reckons. Idi Amin says he believes passionately in not interfering in the affairs of other countries. 
At the same time, he says that Rhodesia and South Africa can be liberated only by armed struggle. It would be wrong to underestimate Field Marshal Idi Amin Dada as a simpleton who should never have been promoted above the rank of sergeant. Delusions of grandeur he may have, but in the confused world of African politics, Amin is a shrewd tactician. No one who gets to know him could doubt his personal honesty or sincerity. Indeed, he's almost childlike in his devotion to high moral principles. It's just that he tolerates no opposition, and that's a frightening combination in a man who sees life in simple terms.